My name is Mary Kane Honeyset. I'm 74 years old. I live in Fulham, South London. And my aim is each year to get a painting accepted for the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. You, um, you live in West London? South West London. All right, I'll do it again. South West London. It's West London. It's called, no, it's called, Lo no, it's not, it's called South West London. Who lives here? Me or you? <laughs> My mum didn't want me to make a film about her, or her paintings. It seemed she had some issues. Don't be silly, I'm not that type of person! I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. I'm not going to do it! But I wanted to know more about her obsession with trying to get her work exhibited at the Royal Academy of Art. She said she would be a boring subject. She said her house was more interesting than she was. So, to a Pisa, I let her talk about her house, but briefly. Uh, the house I live in was built in 1877. My grandparents moved here in 1912. One of Adolf Hitler's bombs blew all the fancy bits off of my railings on June 26, 1944. During the Blitz, when the bombs were dropping, eight people used to hide under here. Um, six adults and two children, my brother and I. At least we were more fortunate than the people across the road because all of those houses over there were knocked down uh, and they were just like these, these houses, but now it's a um, block of flats. I mean, if there had been a direct hit, we wouldn't have stood a ghost of a chance. But as luck would have it, there wasn't a direct hit and we survived. I've lived here for 74 years and um, I can't imagine that I'll ever live anywhere else. But talking about her paintings wasn't going to be quite so easy. If I was going to film her, there would be rules. Her rules. If you're doing a documentary on me, saying you've got to say this, you've got to say that, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to be as I am. Put your hands on your hips. This was going to be trickier than I'd expected. I like this better. Oh, that's very defensive. It's not attractive. You can't see your hips. You can't see it. I just want the angle of your arm. Oh, yeah, I see that now, but I know what you fiddle around with when no, I'm not looking. We started filming. Seeing herself in the TV monitor seemed to both intrigue and confuse her. Now I want to touch that bit of my hair on the other side, but I can't do it. I want to, this is where I want to touch, no, I want to touch the other side. Oh, there's a funny bit of my hair there. Do you want to keep your glasses on or take them off? Um, has it started? Yeah. Oh dear, take them off. Right, now where do I look? Um, there? Yeah. Oh, but yeah. I want the whole of my head in there. I don't want the flat, flat bit cut off at the top. Now she was starting to direct. She was going to be a difficult subject. My ambition was to go to art school, but I had to leave school at 14 to contribute to the family income. So it was out of the question. But it didn't stop me from drawing at every minute that I had to myself. I started studying art, really, at evening classes, um, about 1960, I suppose, and did life drawing, at uh, still life, on portraits. And then I went to a teacher training college and art was my main field of study. I enter painting sometimes one or two or three every year for the Academy, for the Royal Academy. Uh, along with about 20,000 other people. Uh, we all hope that we're going to get our paintings hung. Most of us don't. I, I'm trying again this year. Whether I'll be lucky or not, I don't know. It really is just a question of luck, uh, rather than talent. So, uh, if you haven't got any talent, you have to rely on luck. <laughs> <laughs> This is the smokehouse. It's where they used to smoke all the uh, fish, kippers and bloaters, and it's gone now, like a lot of other places in Fulham. All this has changed now. If you look from my bathroom window now, it looks completely different. Uh, I haven't really got much else to say about that. 
What do you think of your paintings? What do you mean? What do I think of them? Um, well, st start again. Stop. That wasn't the question you asked me before, which was easy to answer. That isn't easy. The council, in their wisdom, or whoever did it, they've replaced it. They replaced it with a hideous... The shambles? No, it wasn't the shambles. That's The it. rumbles? No, um, Julia would know. The shackles? No, it was like a triangle name. I, I forget Three what Three points? No, no. This is a, um, a painting of an old whatever it is. Oh, dear. It's a place where they used to... Oh, I don't know what it's called. A truck. What is it? I don't know. Anyway, I've always liked to draw. I've drawn right from early childhood, really, long before I ever started to paint. I did my first oil painting um, soon after getting the box of oil colours for my birthday. I dabbled around for a bit, and then when I felt that I had the feel of them, then I, I did a little picture. I can't, I can't remember what it was now. It was such a long time ago. I mean, 1949. I mean, that's a long time. How many years is that? 53 years ago. So how old were you when, on your birthday? What birthday 21. My 21st. That's why I had the box of oil paint from, uh, from my husband. Uh, this is the actual box that my husband bought me when I was 21 in 1949. Gosh. So it's quite old. And it was full of oil paints and brushes. I was so excited. And um, I started painting in oil straight away, practicing, copying pictures, and you know, I've always kept the box. Um, a bit beaten up now, but um, I had to keep that. This is a view of, of my backyard. Um, oh, it's wobbling about. The fence has gone, and the wheel has gone. I, I'm sorry, I think the wheel fell to pieces. I wasn't influenced by anybody when I started painting. Nobody. I just, look, I, I really didn't go to exhibitions and I didn't, it's just that I, I looked at these bricks across the road and the, and the houses and I thought, I'd like to paint them. I love um, bricks. I think people ignore them to their peril because if you really look at bricks, they are beautiful, especially old ones. The yellow bricks, red bricks and blue bricks from different parts of the country. Staffordshire blues. Uh, Leicester reds and London yellows and sometimes you get them mixed all up on one wall and then there's these very old crumbly rose coloured bricks that you find. Well, I've lived in Fulham all my life and um, I like to paint the buildings that I know aren't going to be there much longer because Fulham is being rebuilt. The old buildings that I like so much are being replaced with uh, soulless um, edifices. don't like them. Thoughts on a brick wall. A brick wall can be likened to society. The ones at the bottom are grimy and close to the earth, but keep the ones at the top in their elevated position. Sausage and mash and Queen's furnishings, all those old signs, they've all gone. It's such a pity because it reminds, it was a bit of history, reminding us of the past and what things cost. But to a lot of people it was unsightly, and for that reason it's gone. It's a shame. This is Nellie Warner, a florist in Fulham, which again has been... It's no longer a florist, it's nothing, it's just, it's just empty, the place now. He was very sad when the shop closed. I don't know what happened, whether the leaves ran out or what. Brought our funeral wreaths, wedding bouquets, everything there through the years. This is another place that's been demolished since I painted it. Uh, I seem to put the kiss of death on, that, on other places. I paint them and then they're pulled down. It was knocked down about, about 1985, I think. I wouldn't want to paint it now. I mean, looking at that now, I would have no inspiration whatever to paint it. I stood across the road and uh, set up the easel and did it from, uh, from the street and got lots of uh, interruptions. That's what I don't like about painting on the spot. You get too many people come and talk and it, you lose the concentration. This is Fulham Football Club. Uh, it's been here since the late 1800s, but unfortunately it's another part of old Fulham that they want to pull down and replace with luxury flats. We're hoping there's going to be enough protest about it to stop it happening.
But why was the Royal Academy of Art such a big deal anyway? I wanted to find out. Art historian Helen Valentine, who was in charge of the cataloguing project at the Royal Academy, explained. The Royal Academy held its first summer exhibition in 1769. It was a much smaller affair than today. There were only 136 works shown, but it steadily increased in popularity throughout the 18th century. The art establishment in the 18th century was a very open one and in some ways quite underdeveloped. So when the first public exhibitions happened from 1761 onwards, they were very much open to anybody to submit work. So when the Academy had its first exhibition in 1769, that was no different. Anybody could submit work, but the members of the Royal Academy had precedence and their work was shown, however many they wanted to show. In the 18th century, an American artist called Benjamin West managed to persuade George III to bestow royal patronage on the Royal Academy. There had been earlier academies, but none of these had survived, and I think that the success of the Royal Academy owed much to the fact that George III patronised it. My painting is called Stephen Long Antiques, and it's a painting strangely enough, of an antique shop. Well, it's a shop that I've looked in all my life. I can't pass that shop without looking in there. Uh, it's just full of so many interesting things. That's really the main reason. And I like the pink colour at the top of the shop. That's another reason. And also the shape of the windows, the arch, the arches on the window, all about it, you know, everything about it, really. Now, I did a sketch before... Start I did this watercolour. This is... um a watercolour sketch and this is exactly half the size so I refer to this just to sort of make it quicker to get the proportions right and everything. It's a great help to do a watercolour sketch before uh, doing the oil. I make notes of the um, of the colours I need and then I'll go back and take photographs of detail with telephoto lens uh, and with the standard lens I can go close in which I did. I took uh, photographs of the plates with a standard lens because it's impossible to to get all those down outside a very busy thoroughfare. Finding a subject and painting it was only half the story. I had no idea how much work was involved before any brush touched the canvas. Well I stretch my own canvas because then I can buy stretches to the size of the painting I want to do. Um, I work out exactly how big the paint is going to be, what the dimensions are of the subject I'm painting, the size I need to get what I want. Um, the standard size frames are quite often not right, so I'd prefer to make my own to the, to the size I want them. So I buy um, the stretches and the canvas and make them up and that's and that works very well for me. It's so stiff, staple gun. I buy my paints in a little shop in the West End of London. Not only paints, but um, canvas and stretchers there in the West End of London. So that's £7.20p altogether, thank you. Right. Before I start to paint, face with a blank canvas, I make a grid, four inch grid, three or four inch, two and a half. So the windows start there and they come down. Now, let's see how long they've got to be because I have an eye condition where I haven't got any sight really, only peripheral vision in my right eye. Oh, I, I can only see a, a sort of a black thing here and just colours. See how these light, these grid lines help so much. It's going to take me two weeks roughly to paint this painting from start to finish. And then I put it away to dry for a few weeks and then I put retouching varnish on it just before um, I hand it into the academy. And then after, when I get it back, when it's thrown out of the academy, <laughs> I put the, the final varnish on it.
Right, now all the red's done. So now I'm going to let the red dry. If you concentrate just there on fire, I can start painting the window. But if you'd like, I mean, I can't paint down red and then through the window because my, you know. I made myself look like a complete idiot. Yeah, I've done the red. It? When you do painting demonstrations, you don't get people saying, now I'm going to do this, now I'm going to do that. You look at the painter to see what they're doing. So now you would do the, the white? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's what you want. It's not what I want. I haven't got any say in the matter. It's what you want all the time. I was curious to know why she left out the hyphen in her last name when she signed her paintings. Well, the reason for that is that many years ago, an artist friend of mine, a woman, said, don't put the hyphen in your name, and then with any luck, you'll be mistaken for a man, and men's paintings are taken far more seriously than women's. Um, I'm talking about 50 years ago, more than that, really. Um, and times have changed, thankfully, since then. Uh, but I still leave out the hyphen. This is why men are so lucky, men painters, all the men I know who paint. They do so much more work than women painters because they haven't got to go up around and do the shopping or the ironing or the cleaning or the looking after the children. They just leave that to their wives and they get on with their paintings. And it's very unfair, but still, never mind. I think I talk a lot of drivel, but uh, I'm not very articulate, am I? Really. <laughs> Sir Joshua Reynolds was the first president of the Royal Academy. It was the appointment of Sir Joshua Reynolds that really gave prominence to the Royal Academy. He was a very successful portrait painter, and he also believed very strongly on elevating the status of artists in this country. He wrote and published his famous discourses on art. And this sort of set the Royal Academy on the art map of the world because these were read by many prominent artists, not only in England but also abroad. Many famous artists were members of the Royal Academy. One only has to think of Thomas Gainsborough, Turner, Constable, Lord Leighton, and perhaps if one thinks of a contemporary artist such as David Hockney, who is also a member. I began to realise how important the Royal Academy was to her. Her lack of any formal art training had given her an artistic inferiority complex. When people say my work is naive, it really irritates me because I don't consider myself a naive artist. Perhaps I am and I don't realise it, but I don't consider myself one. Um, I know my paintings are very tight and very photographic. Um, I always consider naive paintings are those where Everything isn't quite as it should be, it's sort of... Anyway, I, I, I don't consider myself naive, that's the end of it. Um, but so what if I am? Who cares? So long as I enjoy doing what I'm doing, that's all that matters. Let it be naive, I don't care. One of the rules of submission to the Royal Academy was that every picture must have a frame. Now it was a question of finding the best frame to show off the picture. 
This was the first framing I was going to use for the uh, Steve McLong picture, this one. But when I got it home, uh, I thought it was too ornate for the subject matter. So then I tried that one and uh, when I saw the pieces, I, I made a mistake. So <laughs> I didn't use that one either. Her favourite framing shop was miles away. It was a two hour trip across London and meant lugging the painting with her on two trains and two buses just to get there. But that wasn't going to stop her. She was very picky about finding just the right wood frame for her oil painting and for the Academy of course. It's a bit of a long-winded process uh, going all the way to North London but um, I like doing that, that suits me better because there's such a choice of frames, um, such a choice of mouldings that um, it makes sense. I take the painting with me so that I can match the moulding with the painting and um, I'm more likely then to be satisfied with the end result um, and that's really why I do it. Well, I always like to make my own frames, then I can choose, really, I'm go I know what it's going to look like when it's framed, quite often, I mean in the past I have had pictures framed, and when I've got them back, it hasn't been, it doesn't look as I thought it was going to look, the colour's been wrong or something, it's, so I prefer to make my own. But what were Mum's real chances of getting accepted by the Royal Academy? One of Mum's painting heroes was Royal Academician Ken Howard. He was also on the hanging committee at this year's summer exhibition. So who better to tell me than the man himself? My name's Ken Howard and I've been a member of the Academy now for 20 years. Um, on the whole, you get elected to the Academy when you're around about 50. Some people earlier, but round about. And I showed in the Academy for 32 years before I was made a member, which is quite a long run. I started showing when I was 18, and I was 50 when they decided that they wanted me. And um, so I became a member of the Academy at that time. The exhibition as a whole is made up of 1,300 works. Of those 1,300, there are 80 RAs that have got the right to have six pictures. They won't all send, but shall we say 60 have five pictures each, on average, okay? That's 300 taken straight away. But you could say that you end up with probably 900 paintings by non-members hung. I had no idea Mum was into carpentry. Using a rusty old mitre saw wasn't going to stop her making her own frame. And having only one good eye was a minor hindrance. Uh, well, to make a frame, of course, you need a mitre block. The only hard part about it, I think, is the actual sawing of the mitres. Because I haven't got the strength that I used to have. I used to saw them in a couple of seconds, but now it takes me a longer time. The mitre block I'm using 
I've had it for many years and part of it has become worn it and that causes a slight discrepancy okay. in the mitre. Oh, right, right. So, I need to, I need loads like, you know, the oh, mitre right. block I've got is rubbish. You know, I need quick punchy lines. Well, I wouldn't use it if it was rubbish, would I? That's that's ridiculous to say that. I wouldn't use it if it was rubbish. Framing was going well until she realised she didn't have any glue. Well, I hope I can find some glue after all that. Be some here somewhere, which means I've got to go out and get some more. I thought I had the brad all in here, but I haven't got it in here. I'll get the brad all when I make it at the side. I might come out and do that in a minute, I think. Oh, one of these days I'm going to tidy up this shed. One day I should tidy up the shed. I've got a Thankfully, the glue shop was closer than the framing store. Where are you going to use the washer? Oh, well, I, I screwed the, that into the, the canvas because the rebate isn't deep, deep enough to do it the other way. Right, right. Screw it into the canvas. And then pass the screw through it. And then pass the screw through it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do, yeah. yeah. That's it, yeah. And but I use a washer because my husband always used the washer. Yeah. I, I, I don't do it basically. No, no, what I usually do is nip them with a pair of pliers to squeeze them in. Oh, do you? <laughs> Save using the washer, but you know, your ways probably used, needs that. Yeah, that's washer. fine, yeah. It's an easy way to do it, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll take that okay. down. And then well, if I suddenly remember something, I'll come down here. Right, just get across the ground. I think that's a bit right. We've got one, two, three, four. Yeah, that's it, exactly. Right, okay. Okay, lovely. Okay, okay. cheers. I offered to help, but she insisted she knew exactly what she was doing. Got to glue all four corners together and then tighten them up. See that uh, frame of equipment isn't as accurate as I'd like it to be, and there's going to be a bit of discrepancy. Making the frame was looking like more work than painting the picture that would go in it. If I had any sense, I'd have undone the knots first. But as I haven't got any sense, I didn't. Look. After 38 years oh, of making picture frames, she was still refining oh, her technique. Well, that didn't work, so now I've got to stand together and hold these till the glue dries. So, uh, what's the time now? 10 o'clock. Any luck? I'll be upstairs by 1. <laughs> I put these books on here so that the frame doesn't ride up because one piece rides up and of course that's hopeless. So the only way around it is to put these books on and just hope for the best. And I come down in about an hour to see everything's okay. But those corners will have to be darkened because you can definitely see the, the line. Next time I'm going to a framers. It's easier, much easier. I'm going to put this retouching varnish on because um, it makes the colours look nice just before I put it in for an exhibition. If by any chance it's sold then I'll have to get in touch with the buyer 
and go to their house, that's what I've done in the past, and uh, put the final varnish on there. Yeah, you see the way it brings out the colours, they look, uh, they look brighter when you put the stuff on. I went into Stephen Long's today to, uh, as I said, I'd never been in there and I wanted to go in there. The poor old man in there, he's a bit grumpy. I don't think he, uh, I think he thought I was up to no good. <laughs> Probably when I take the books off and lift up the uh, the frame, it's all going to fall to pieces. That would be interesting. Isn't it? Definitely got to get something for these corners. Spark. They show white with a gap. The truth <sighs> of the matter was that she made her own frames because she really couldn't afford to have her pictures framed professionally. Not that she'd ever admit it, of course. Can you talk to me while you're doing it? Well, I could do, but I find it difficult to, uh, to do it anyway and to talk at the same time. I think I'll just stand here in the exhibition like that and I think I've done a very good portrait, very lifelike. <laughs> Adam's holding the side. <laughs> but a lot of people say you do great paintings. Um. No, I don't think they say use the word great. They might say nice or um, pleasant. I don't think that great really can be applied to anything I do, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I'm just an amateur struggling along. I'm going to put this in the frame now. Oh dear, I think the frame's a bit too big. Oh, it's a bit too big, but there's nothing I can do about it now. So what are you doing? Right, now I've made those holes, I'll take this out and uh, I'm going to screw the eyelet holes in first. Right, I'm sticking the brown paper on, not only to neaten the, uh, the back of it, but also to hide the fact that there's a gap between the canvas and the, um, and the frame. There's a funny archaic thing where the presidents of other academies like the Hibernium, which is the Irish Academy, the Scottish, which is the Scottish Academy, and the West of England, which is the West of England Academy, their president has the right to have a picture in the summer exhibition. So there's little bits like that. The painting was finished, varnished and framed. It was now time to take it to the Academy to be judged, alongside thousands of other works. So all us hopefuls, we trot along with our pictures every April and hope that we're going to get accepted. You have to pay to have your pictures considered for the exhibition. Um, 18 pounds for every picture. When I first started painting, I think it was seven and six, the equivalent of 35p, but now it's 18 pounds, you know, everything goes up. So that you can exhibit three paintings for that which is £54. But if you don't get any accepted, uh, you don't get any invitation to attend the exhibition at all while it's on, which I think is a bit mean on the part of the Royal Academy. But that's the way it is.
getting accepted by the Royal Academy would mean her painting would hang on the very same walls where some of the greatest names in art history had exhibited in previous centuries. Her passion for acceptance seemed well founded. There was nothing left to do now but wait to hear from the Royal Academy Selection Committee. My grandmother um, died, well, started to die while she was winding up her clock. I always think of that whenever I wind up the clock. Well, my aim every year is to get a paint. My aim. My aim every year. That was a game. Um, Prince Charles famously has exhibited uh, watercolours at the summer exhibition. He did use a pseudonym though, but funnily enough the press did get hold of the true identity of the exhibitor. We sell over two million pounds worth of work in the summer exhibition, of which the artists give 30% to the Academy, that is the commission. By comparison to Bond Street, that is very little. Bond Street commission is around about 50%. In the past, they, they used to get in the newspaper, the, the ones that got A's. You never get an A at the Academy now, ever, because the Academy is so varied. The selection committee, which is 12 people, now never get a unanimous vote. So there aren't any A's really. This year there wasn't one A. Now of the D's, they then get put in the galleries before the hanging starts. And the hanging committee, as against the selection committee, which is in fact the same group of people, come into the galleries and then go round and select from those D's the things they want to put into their room. It is then their choice. It's no longer a consensus. I must come along uh, one day at this time of day with the lights like this, because it, these houses really are lovely. They're so old, at least two or three hundred years, I should think and all these lovely ice cream colours that they painted them, blue and pink and green. Uh, this is my local pub. Uh, I had to do a painting of it because it's uh, one of those pubs that haven't changed over the years. I mean, this has been like this, I should think, since the beginning of the 19th century. It might, might even be the end of the 18th. I'm, I've tried to find out the date, but the publicans don't even know themselves, so... Preparations were underway for the grand opening of the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. The turnover is roughly 20 million a year. It must be the only business of that size that is run by a lot of artists. Obviously, we've got a fantastic staff that make work whatever we decide. So, in fact, there's a bursar, there's a secretary, there is a head of events, there is an exhibitions organiser, there are all these people who are employed by the Academy. And there are over 200 of them, so there's a big staff, and they are, in fact, the people that make the members' ideas work, if you like. And if the members decide something is not going to happen, it doesn't happen. This year, there are various points. There's first of all a designated room, which is designated to Anthony Green, who has been a member for some time, and he's been given a room where he has hung all his work in that one room, and his work is very autobiographical. So it's a room about the life of Anthony Green, if you like. My name's Anthony Green, I'm a Royal Academician, and I've been exhibiting at the Royal Academy Burlington House in London since 1966. And my colleagues in their folly elected me an academician in 1971. And this year I'm showing a very large piece of sculpture called Resurrection. It's almost like a medieval float, and the name, in a sense, gives it away. And what I'm attempting to do, by both intellectual and spiritual and artistic means, is to get my entire family through the gates of paradise 
and because this is England, we're going by train and we're leaving from Gospel Oak Railway Station. It's a kind of good non-conformist Reformation nudge that it's called Gospel Oak. Do you get it? It's a sort of only an Englishman could think up a, a, a wheeze for going to paradise, like leaving from Gospel Oak Station. It does exist. It's in North London, and I have lived there for 42 years. So it's 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 personal narrative and that consists of objet troupe, it's got a clock that belonged to my granny, a chandelier that belonged to my grandfather, it's got dolls which are portraits of my dead relatives which are made out of the linen trousseau that my mother was given when she got married to my dad in 1933. So in a sense it's a sculpture which is like it's sort of sociologically little history. And I suppose academists are quite good at big history, and nowadays we do little history, what the French charmingly called petite histoire. The fateful day had arrived. The postman would deliver the news. Would she be accepted or rejected? Nerves were on edge. The works can have one of three categories. They can either be accepted, which means every member of the selection committee is agreed that that picture should be in. Now the D's are ones that get, shall we say, four votes. Four people say, yes, I think we should consider this. And that gets a D. Anything that doesn't get four votes gets an X. And that's out. It's here. It's arrived. Great. I hope it's great. wrong. Another day, another day. I get so many days, you know. It's very disappointing. I don't agree with their decision. They're the all-powerful, almighty ones, so we have to abide by what they think is right, whether or not we agree with it. I think it's a bit harsh saying D for Doubtful because they have in fact been passed by the selection committee and um, they're only doubtful because it doesn't fit in with the rest of the exhibition or whatever. It's a pity because People like to buy paintings that have been exhibited in the Academy. But also you can ask more money for it. And um, I could have done with the money. I mean, really, to be perfectly honest, I could have done with it. But uh, there you go. I didn't, uh, I didn't get in. It was press day at the summer exhibition. A first chance for art critics to meet the Royal Academicians who were on the selection committee and who had chosen all the works on show. Photographers and journalists from the London Times and various other prestigious newspapers listened. As Lord Norman Foster spoke about art, architecture and air travel. Well, you try getting in and out of Heathrow. You try getting in and out of, you know, mm. Kennedy. Yeah. Yes, I, <laughs> I can't tell you that's not being... I love being, um, I love being up high. I live in a contemporary world with a sense of history that goes back 10,000 years and I'm very aware of the fact that artists make large things occasionally, they try to make grand gestures. More often than not we all fall flat on our faces and retire with egg on face, if I can sort of split my metaphors. In Paris I went to see Rodin's Gates of Hell, which are terrifying. Being a man of an optimistic nature, where I feel that, in a sense, on the whole, give us a chance, we'll probably survive, 
I surely am trying to wrestle with the gates of paradise, which is a different ball game to the gates of hell. Anybody who's looked through the gates of hell in Rodin's great sculpture in Paris would probably, in fact, not survive to tell the tale. Hopefully, when you actually creep through my gates of paradise, you will, in fact, find everlasting life, either in an artistic or a spiritual sense. Dare I say, are you coming for the ride? Big, beautiful, brash, and above all, daring, because I'm daring to fail. that I dislike the most are the ones that win the prizes. I can't, I can't understand that. Not for the life of me, I can't understand it. But uh, they win these fantastic amounts of money for doing what I would consider the most inane pieces of art. I mean, I've seen people um, who go to the exhibition actually laugh. I've seen people laugh at them. The small south room, which is the one I hunt, is very, very popular with the public. And also, it gives an opportunity for a lot of non-members to get their work in. Because I hung 215 works in that one room, from floor to ceiling. Which is what I like to think the, the summer exhibition is about. It's a small room, and therefore it won't take, necessarily, big pictures. And it's the, it always was, and I'm sure it will be this year, the most popular room in the whole of the summer exhibition. There are still a lot of people that buy their annual picture at the summer exhibition. They love the idea that they bought their picture. 
at the summer exhibition. And of course the paintings in this room are very affordable. I mean, very affordable. There's a very beautiful little picture down there that's, I think it's about 150 pounds or something, which I mean, almost wouldn't pay for the frame. The room's full of little gems at affordable prices. And um, not only that, they are all paintings in here that speak to you very directly. You know, they're not, there's not a great ambiguity about them or they're not, in inverted commas, difficult pictures. They're paintings that people can live with and enjoy and, and every day will give them an, 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 a bit of extra sort of revelation or satisfaction or whatever. Painters are always fascinated by it. I mean, you're your own best model because you're always there when you want them. They never don't turn up. They never ask for a rest. <laughs> you're your own best model, really, aren't you? Yeah. I can only tell you that mine, for instance, this year, vary from 1,900 up to 30,000. The biggest one I've got in is 30,000. The smallest one I've got in is 1,900. I was inspired to buy that picture, um, the Ken Howard you No know, Surrender, because of the directness of it, the um, message it was sending. I thought it was quite powerful. The, the members do have the right to send six pieces in. So this year I've sent this one, which is a medium sized one, two small pictures in the small south room, and then these two up here the one of a uh, model in my studio and the one of Venice. Does this gentleman here want a photograph? The summer exhibition was now open to the general public. I wondered if she would go and see the paintings that had been chosen over hers. Mum bought a new summer outfit and took the tube to Piccadilly Circus. What would she think of the exhibition? Seeing the works at the summer exhibition that had been accepted, Mum waited in line to take home what had been rejected.
damn anything. I'm not going to damn things just because it's not my scene. Um, because that is a very un uneducated approach to art. You, you, I mean, I hate it. A lot of people hate it. And, but I'm not going to name um, conceptual painters that I know, or not, I don't know, but like, I know of. Like who? I'm not going to name them because, um, all right then, uh, um, Damien Hurst with his, uh, his animals cut in half. The, the thing is, my painting didn't fit in with the other pictures and um, so it wasn't hung. I mean, that's it, you know, end of story. The press had reviewed the summer exhibition and the reviews were fairly unanimous. There aren't any other academies that have been around as long as ours. The reason why we are still around is we change. We're not cutting edge, an academy cannot be cutting edge. But the academy evolves and changes all the time. Got a little thing in the corner of your eye. I can never understand people who say they get bored because there's so much you can do in life. If, if you're healthy enough to do it, and I'm, I'm lucky enough to be healthy enough to do it. But, um, never bored, never lonely. Just enjoy myself all the time. That's it, really. I wondered. Maybe she was ready to hang up her paintbrushes. And this is what I'm entering for next year's exhibition. Maybe not.